All right, my name is Glendon Cameron, and this webinar is about old school sourcing. No thrift stores needed. This is what I used to do when we ran into the droughts. When, for some reason, it just happened with storage auctions. There would just be a period of time. There was nothing out there. I mean, it was just really, really strange. Sometimes it would be a week or two. Most times it would be a week or two. But there was an extended period that scared me. It really did because it was about eight weeks, two months. And this wasn't tax season. It was just there was nothing out there. Our customer base was built. We had to have products. So I had to come up with other ways to get a lot of product. This will be based on volume. This isn't like onesies and twosies. This is stuff that I used to do to get a truckload of furniture or inventory or something. So with that, let's jump into it. Anything that sells once usually will sell again. Many people become blindsided by the Ducati. Everyone's like, I want the nice stuff. I want the good stuff. I want the really, really nice. Give me the nice stuff. With little regard to something as simple as a collection of books that may be in your house that could sell for good coin. Broaden your horizons to what inventory is. Inventory can be if you're sitting at your desk, anything on your desk could be inventory. It just really, really depends on what your business goals are. And, you know, this is more into you must change your concept of product because this old phone, I bought a unit full of old phones, uh, old telephones, uh, not, let's say telephone booths, I'm sorry. I did not know that there was a demand for those things. I was kind of pissed because unless you're, you know, there's people who've never seen the telephone booth. We're like 20 some years old. They've never seen one. But there was demand. Uh, people use them for props and stuff. So being in the storage auction business seriously expanded my concept of what product was. I was in the office furniture business and I sold new furniture. So, you know, product to me was something that came from a distribution center. You went there, you got it and you sold it. I didn't know product was record players. I didn't know product was handles that went on pots. I didn't know that lids like Lee Crochet is. So there's a lot of things that you can sell that, you know, go into my video on YouTube. It doesn't have to be sexy to sell, but it can make you a lot of money. This is the thing that many people fail to do sell what you know if you have a hobby start from there and if you ascertain that your hobby isn't profitable then you move on but if you're an artist there's inherent knowledge that you have on things that are very expensive because i was i used to be an artist in my former life commercial art clay visual arts oil paintings i used to do all that and if you're an artist you know that quality painting supplies are expensive. Many people want to become artists, right? And they're like, oh, they'll go out and get the canvas. They'll get the oils and they'll go through this phase and then they won't do anything with it. You can put an ad on Craigslist looking for art supplies, just like, hey, I buy used art supplies for my kindergarten class or I buy art supplies for my church group. And get the stuff for little enough and you will be amazed at what a tube of oil paint can go for. It is not a cheap preoccupation. Also, say you're a car enthusiast. Say you love Mustangs. You can make a comfortable living selling nothing but Mustang parts. Just find a Mustang somewhere in your city. Part it out. Put the pieces on eBay. Sell what you know. That's what I came onto YouTube with was selling the storage auction information because that's what I knew and the furniture and that's what I knew. And now I'm selling something different because the last four and a half years I've learned something different. So you can sell what you know and there's some things that you want to learn about. You can go on a crash course for say take 90 days and I'm going to learn everything I can about this topic, this items, these things. 90 days of concentrated study could make you an expert. Seriously could. There's a guy by the name of Lewis Howes. He was laid up with an injury. He, he tried to play football professionally and or amateurly. Six months, he just spent a lot of time learning how LinkedIn worked. Wrote a book about it. 
fellow, you know, network with other people and created several products and he makes seven figures a year from something he knew nothing about originally, but now he knows. So don't be intimidated if there's something you want to know about, but create a list of everything that you know about. Is it Beanie Babies, cookware, cars, furniture, drapes, baby clothes, whatever you have a substantial knowledge base on, go into the marketplaces and see if that stuff is selling and sell that. It's going to be easier for you because your learning curve will not be as steep. And once you get that going, go out and find some other stuff that you don't know about, because this is my recommendation to you. Go ahead, create an income stream for something that you know. You may not like it. You may not want to do it. But the whole thing is to create the income stream with this stuff. And when you have the money coming in, that gives you options to do other things. So definitely sell what you know. Develop a plan. You, you have to have a plan. As I said before, there's um, two groups of hustlers. The get money hustler, a.k.a. the opportunistic hustler, or the strategic hustler. Strategic hustler is someone that sat down and said, I am going to take an inventory of what I want to do, what I, my skill sets, my capital base, and I'm going to create a plan. And part of that plan is an income goal. It can be whack the first few times you do it because you don't have numbers. But once you start selling, you, you'll get a better feel for what your numbers should be. I put this desk up to show you because I often talk about I bought a unit full of mid-century's desk. That's the desk that I, I got. Some had legs like that and some had the fat boy legs. Those things were selling for 950 to 1500 bucks, just the way they were. Because to find them in good condition was rare. So bring me to the next thing. Volume. Many, many people are stuck on onesies and twosies and threesies. And I'll go get something and I'll sell it. I'll go get something else and I'll sell it. You've got to create a three-tiered plan where you have enough capital to run your business, buy stuff, and some holdback capital to take advantage of opportunities. Now, I put a house up there for obvious reason. Well, maybe not so obvious. Everything that you're looking at on that house, I've sold. And you're looking at shingles. Yes, you're looking at woodwork. Yes, you're looking at ceiling fans. Yes, you're looking at windows, fences, doors, all that stuff that you see in that picture, I've got another storage units. Now, a lot of it was new, which makes it an easier sell. But people buy old windows, people buy old doors, people buy all kinds of stuff. Now, if you want to make a livable income, you're going to need volume. You're definitely going to need volume. And that's why I say buy the house. Start thinking of how can you get a hundred pieces a week of a particular product or a hundred pieces a week of particular products. Cause the thing is if you can get your hands on 100 items every week, whether it's clothing, furniture, jewelry, gold coins, whatever, a hundred pieces every week, that's 400 pieces. So you're using eBay, a uh, typical eBay sell through rate. When I was doing it, it could be better. It could be worse. I'm just going to give you a number for this illustration. Is 20%. So you've got 400 items per month. You're selling 80. So you're selling them for 20 bucks a piece. Profit. 20 bucks a piece net profit. That's $1,600. It's almost $20,000 a year. Just on that. And that's at a $20 net profit base. You could do better. You can do higher. There'll be flux. But the thing is, you got to get to the point of handling volume. My recommendation in this one is if you're doing eBay and Amazon, you really need to split it up. eBay has a valet program where they sell the stuff for you. I know the percentage seems high, but you don't have to ship it. You don't have to find a box for it. There's a lot of things you don't have to deal with. If you're going to sell on eBay, use the valet service. Two, you sell on Amazon, use Amazon FBA. Let me be really, really clear. I am not saying abandoning what you're doing for your own personal platform. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is you want to use the efficiency of these platforms and their tools for your benefit 
They give you more time to build your thing. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, don't ever, 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 ever lose track of what you want to do. You want to have your own thing somewhere. You want to have your own products. You want to have your own website. You, you really want to do that because the thing is, everyone talks about this. Hey, Glendon. It take a long time, man, to build up some traffic to a website and there's nobody there. Everybody's at eBay and they all over there on Amazon. Why am I going to take the time to and the effort and the money to build my own website when I can use these other platforms? And I told that person, that's an excellent question. And I was like, do you expect to live for the next 10 years? Yeah. Do you expect to live for the next 20 years? Yeah. Do you expect to live for the next 30 years? Yeah. If it takes your website 10 years to catch fire and you just told me that you expect to live for another 30 years, you've got 20 years of easy peasy money. Yeah. The, the whole thing is think long term. Do this short term hustle to get immediate cash. You know, whatever you have to do, but still have a strategic long term plan for generating money. I don't care if it's hustling. I don't care if it's selling houses. I don't care if it's selling bricks. I don't care if it's selling baby pacifiers. Have some kind of long range plan, because the thing is, in this new disruptive economy, you have to manage a lot of different stuff now. So if you're managing a lot of different stuff. You want to have as many tools of efficiency working for you. The Amazon FBA. And, you know, I've heard people say, why would I use Amazon FBA? I ship my own stuff. I don't need them. And work yourself down to the nub. This is what's happening. Amazon, eBay, they've made it very treacherous for a seller that you don't get too many error passes. You know, you do something wrong. Okay, fine. It happens. But if you get too many negative comments, too many bad ratings, they limit you or just kick you off the site. Whereas if you're doing that and you're doing it well, working on eBay and Amazon, but you're still over here building your site, learning SEO, doing all this other stuff, right? If that happens, you're more prepared because you were working on your own thing. And I know that, you know, this is supposed to be about sourcing, but this is part of the plan because if you're going to go out there and source, you need a long term plan. What are you looking for? How are you going to fit this? Because the thing is, you go out there and just like do opportunistic hustling all the time. You develop a habit of not planning for the long term and it can kill you in this new economy. Now, I want to change your mind. Because the thing is, you hear all this stuff about, you know, sourcing product and people think it's rocket science. It's not rocket science. Sourcing product today is rocket science in this current environment because of the transparency of online retail. If you have a product, someone can do a script on your website, figure out how many people went to that page figure out your page rank, fill out if you're selling this stuff. Amazon is very good at this. And before you know it, all these other people are selling your product because of the transparency of the internet and the immediacy of gaining information. So you got to have a plan and you've got to have some stuff that's kind of hard to source. That's why, you know, uh, in the Hustle University, when we start talking about product creation, we're going to be talking about, you know, making your own labels, private label stuff, buying straight from a distributor, uh, little tricks like when you buy your stuff, you take it out of the boxes that it came in and you repackage it and you'll send it to Amazon FBA. They can't buy it if they don't know where you got it from. They may like, OK, this is selling well, but they don't know your margins. Many people only set out to source in the hot stuff like the bolos and all this other stuff. Don't get caught up like that. Once again, you're managing different tracks. If you got this track, or we're going to do the hot stuff. OK, make that 25, 30 percent of your business. Or, you know, as a Mason say, a 33 and a third, then 33 and a third on something else, 33 and a third on something else. Because when we got the big bitch slap from eBay, if we didn't have Craigslist, our warehouse and other things we were doing, 
we would have been out of business. We would have been completely and utterly out of business. So understand in this managing of stuff, start opening up your mind to the possibilities of selling more than what you're selling. Because so many things sell. I, I mean, I'm looking at my desk. There's a microphone. There's a camera. There's some hats. There's a lamp. There's a uh, external hard drive. Tons of stuff. There's some, uh, you know, external battery chargers. Like you know, for your iPhone, you just got this thing you carry around with you, and you plug it in, and it gives you a little juice. I have a lot of stuff on my table that will sell. Stapler, not for much. Battery charger. Start thinking like that. Because you're going to have some stuff that's going to be low margin when you when you start selling this stuff. But you just kind of mix it in. Like, if your low margin stuff has a high enough sales rank for Amazon or eBay, just send it to the Amazon FBA. Just send it to eBay Valet. And send a lot of it. And let them do the heavy lifting and the packing and all this other stuff. Just do that. Because really, the big deal about sourcing is about cost and markup. I don't care how well you source stuff. If the markup's wrong, you're not going to make good money or you may lose money. So that's the most important thing. Now, I'm going to give you a few of my little secrets. Craigslist was my bitch selling and buying all day long. I have this uh, up here for a reason. It is the auto parts section of Craigslist. A lot of people ignore this because it's a guy section. If you spend a lot of time here, you'll find deals. For my old BMW, I had a 1994 525i. I used to call him Thor before he died. Yes, he died. We 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 said a eulogy, and but he's okay. But Thor needed some new shoes one day, and I was looking at the tires. They were going for the car, and they were like 210, 220 a piece. Just for the tires. And I really didn't like those tires. Because they, they just weren't. They didn't like the ride. I was like I'm not going to get those. So I go to my friend Craigslist. And I start looking. And I don't find it on day one. I don't find it on day two. It actually took me about four weeks. To come across this deal. There's a guy up in Marietta. He had four BMW. BBS. Mesh rims. And tires. And the tires still had the titties on them when I saw him in the picture. And he was asking three seventy five. And I said, hmm, hmm. So I called him and we, we really didn't connect. And I eventually got to him about two days later. I go up there. He's dragging tires from behind his house. Tires are fine. So I haggle him down to 300 bucks. I then go literally two miles away to this place, this tire shop. And I had them place the tires on my vehicle. The tires were balanced. Not dry rot, right, perfectly fine. Threw my tires and rims in the trunk in the back seat. Put them on Craigslist and sold them for $150. So if you're doing the math, I got brand new tires with the titty still on it. Brand new rims, 17-inch rims, mesh, for $150. Bucks. Now, as Paul Harvey says, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. He didn't say it like that, but I'm gonna get, you know, he normally he says that's the rest of the story. When I sold Thor... I took the shoes off and I sold them for $450. So I made a $300 profit on the rims and used tires two and a half years after the fact. That is the power of Craigslist. If you know what you're looking for, you have knowledge to what it is, and you're willing to be consistent with your search. You can do this stuff for profit all day long. Now, we're going to do a special automation webinar because I got some stuff that's coming. I'm just going to let y'all know. Since y'all are family, uh, today I went out and talked to a distributor for some of the stuff that I'm going to send to Amazon FBA. Um, my daughter is coming to live with me, and one of her christening gifts is we're going to start a corporation and all this other stuff. And I went out and, you know, I'm, I was already signed up with the company. I just had to make sure what they were doing to get a price sheet. Because what I'm going to teach you to do with Amazon FBA is to go out and find your own products. I know retail arbitrage is great. Going to thrift stores is great. But if you can find two products that sell to the tune of 100 items per month and you make $30 from those products and you can get them frequently, 
to me, that is better than going thrifting around in thrift stores. And, and you know, because <clears throat> the people who do retail arbitrage work very, very hard. The ones that are successful work very, very, very hard. Going back to my personal goals of what I want for my life and my family, freedom. So for me to do Amazon FBA the way that other people are doing it, because, you know, unless you're going to get some new stuff, it's very hard to automate getting the used stuff because you physically have to go out, physically have to scan, physically have to go to websites and look this stuff up. But if you can find some items, you know, anywhere from two to 30 items that you can get brand new and ship, it's just to me a better concept of the whole thing. So that's just, you know, that's coming. That's coming. The automation uh, deal and the new product things to Amazon. Now, this is a one of the lies I used to tell that wasn't really a lie. I started an estate bio company called Prime River and I had a little fancy logo and everything and I would just put it up on there. It's like, hey, you know, we'll do your estate sales or if you really, really don't want to have an estate sale, we may buy everything for our own liquidation process. Met with most people. Most people wanted to have an estate sale. I would uh, form that out and refer to someone and get a little cash on the back end. And I would get one or two a month that would sell me everything they were going to have for their estate sale. They didn't want to have an estate sale. Uh, usually these were very sad events. You have to have a certain level of compassion because granddad, grandma, someone passed on and they're getting rid of those memories. So it's pretty rough. But the most I've ever spent on one house, and it was a four bedroom house, I spent five grand. Uh, typically, I was getting this stuff for anywhere from uh, 800 bucks to 1500 bucks. I'm talking about house full of stuff because this is how i would do it i would say it and it's all about your presentation i would go in and it's like hey i'm glendon prime river this is what we do and i would pick 40 or 50 things it's like well i'm interested in this but i'm not interested in all that small stuff so we work a deal and i give them a price for the big stuff because i already know what's coming next well since you got to come back um Tell you what, give me 50 bucks and you can have all that small shit, too. <laughs> and I often made more money on the small stuff. Because you have to understand the psychology. When you go in there and you get the big stuff, they know that a lot of people are not going to come to the estate sale for the small stuff, except for real hustlers. The real hustlers will show up. Rain, shine, snow, don't care. They're showing up because... Sometimes I got incredible deals for just simply showing up. I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't the smartest knife in the drawer. I just showed up. So by creating a buyout company and running an ad on Craigslist, you have to run that consistently. Because the thing is, if you run it, because the first three months were kind of like buckets. You know, I get a few bites. But people who had saw the ad was consistent. It's like, yeah, I saw your ad a few weeks ago. And, you know, we have a situation. So you have to look at it as long term marketing for this thing to work and understand that most people will be disappointed with you because you're not trying to hold the estate sale. You're trying to get in there first. You want first crack at everything. And you can get some serious deals because when they see that they're going to get, you know, fifteen hundred, three thousand, five thousand, that's a lot of cash. Now, if you're dealing with an informed seller that knows that, oh, you're going to give them five thousand, but everything in the house is worth forty. You might have some problems, but buyer beware, seller beware. But that was a very nifty way that I got a lot of product during those lean years. I know it sounds strange, 2014, but ads in the newspaper still work for a certain demographic. And the cool thing is a lot of times you can get it free by going to their online version. Sometimes they'll let you list it for themselves because there are certain people who still for some reason, so go to the newspapers to look stuff up. I know it sounds crazy, but they do. Cracks me up, but they do. So that's another thing for you to think about. Now, this is some stuff that I did not do, but I know about it. And I have uh, done it on Facebook. This is how to make your Facebook group work. Create your own. Create your own and you bring people in. You be the organizer, you be the originator. 
That is how you will make your group pop. Because the thing is, when you join someone else's group, you can sell stuff. But if you start it and you kind of steer the direction of the group, kind of groom it uh, to a certain way, you can change the complexion of the group. Like say, do a Facebook group, use furniture Facebook group. That's all you do is use furniture, nothing else. That's going to populate very well in Google. When you're just doing shotgun stuff and everything, it may still pop up in Google, but a strong theme really works well. <laughs> and the door to door still works. Now, this is more for business inventory. I worked in, you know, I had a warehouse and we were in an industrial complex. If you are going to, if you're looking for certain things, you knock door to door and say, look, uh, the, you know, I'm just going to use uh, aluminum cans or no, I'm, I'm going to use phone systems. Go door to door and say, hey, do you have any used phone systems that you don't want? We're paying cash today. You may knock on 30 doors. Now, this is the thing that I've noticed when you go door to door and you're looking to buy something, you're more well received. <laughs> you know, it's not like, no, we don't want. Oh, you want to buy something? So just pick an industrial complex with a certain item that you want that you sure they may have on um, small businesses going to have phone systems. They're going to have used computers. They're going to have office furniture, they're gonna have office chairs, just depending. And then you may come across a business. And this is another tip that I should tell you. There's something called wholesale on top of wholesale. That's how I got my bedroom set out of Paramart. Um, my bedroom set was 1500 bucks for two nightstands, king size platform bed, dresser and mirror. Wholesale on that deal a few years ago was 3200 bucks, and they were selling in the finer stores for 6500 They discontinued it, and I want you to remember this. A lot of times when a company discontinues something, they just blow it out. Just blow it out. And it's still new. It still works. And you can get that stuff even cheaper than wholesale. But still sell it close to retail price, or sometimes if it's something that people want, even more. So start thinking of business inventory. Start thinking of, I mean, once again, going back to the beginning, open your mind to what product is. You could go to, say, there was a place, uh, my, my warehouse used to be on the Mountain Industrial in Tucker. There was this place that was selling batteries. They went out of business and they just was blowing out batteries. I went in there one day. I saw a guy. He was a flea market guy. I could tell. He walked out with a pallet of brand new batteries for 50 bucks. Yes, a pallet about three to four feet high of brand new batteries for 50 bucks. He could sell those things for five bucks a pack and make a lot of money. I don't know what he was selling for, but these are brand new batteries. So you got to look for those sales. Uh, the desk that I'm using in my office, I got from a business moved and they were selling all kinds of stuff. They had iPads, like 100 iPads for 150 bucks. That was the first things to go. Um, that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. Big stuff, volume stuff, new stuff. But going door to door still works if you're trying to buy. Now, let's just get down to the nitty gritty. You've seen all this stuff on YouTube and people like flipping from a dollar. The number of people that can support themselves run a business and work 20 30 40 hours a week and also have another job that's supporting the bills take all of that money from that new business and reinvest it over and over again until it gets to a certain amount is rare it's rare everyone's not going to reinvest that money and just keep flipping it and flipping it and flipping it because you got a business, you got a job, you got your business flipped up to like 20000 a month. The transmission in your car goes out. It's four grand. What are you going to do? You're pulling the money out of the business because you got it, which means you, you, you have to start over. So I'm going to give you a different strategy. And some people may disagree. Uh, other people may agree. You need $5,000 to $20,000 war chest, preferably cash. If you don't have cash, if you got a credit card, let me tell you how to do this. 
you can use your credit card now this is what you do there's a lot of deals out there i can tell you discover is offering 14 months interest free for the first 14 months so what you do if you don't have one is you get one of those credit cards which gives you time to use the money as capital and also you're not paying the interest monster but no the interest monster will kick in if you do not pay the balance in those 14 months but take this card and only use it for things that you know you're going to sell this is not money that you would just gamble like i got a hunch yeah no 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 this would be like say you found a widget and you know this widget absolutely positively sells on amazon for thirty dollars and you have a chance to get 200 of them for 10 bucks or five bucks that's a go you did your research you know what's selling you know what you're looking at you know you're getting the deal you use that money for that type of stuff no speculating no i'm gonna ball that no none of that stuff it is strictly for sure bets and use your cash for the other stuff because the thing is that five thousand bucks is not your money it's credit and it has to be paid back but credit used properly can grow your business much faster than flipping you can get to the same point in 90 days with credit card use that someone may take a year or two to flip up to and i know that it's like you know um no debt i don't know anybody it sounds good but the fact of life is most of this country was built on credit i'm not saying get to the point where you're like eyeballs deep in debt but use your good credit on good buys that's what you can use it for things you know you can flip and also if you're going to do this get yourself a good rewards card american express uh, chase sapphire is good if you're going to be flipping a lot of money on that card, make sure you're getting rewards because you can get two or three trips out the year. You, It's just the hustler mindset. You're already doing it. Why not get all the benefit that you can? But to really play this game correctly, you're going to need some money. You're going to need access to capital. You're going to need access to funds because if you could come out with, let's just leave it at 5000 and you get the right inventory at the right price and go to Amazon FBA. You might get that back plus some friends called uh, profit first 30 to 60 days if you're buying right and you're selling right or sooner. Whereas if you're trying to flip up to that, you're going to go through several different sales cycles. And what I mean by sales cycles is you have this product, right? And it's January and this product is selling for 50 bucks. Well, if it's selling well and other people going back to the transparency of the Internet, other people are looking at that. So by the time you flip up to get it, the selling price is 30. So you've missed out on a lot of profit because you were not in a position to buy when it was hot. So this is another thing that happens when you're trying to flip up or, you know, come up or parlay, as fun people say. You need some money to play this game correctly. You really do. All right, that is that part of the session. And I am going to open up the floor to questions. What do we have here? This is from Javier. Hey, G, what do you think about those online auction houses that liquidate businesses like office furniture and equipment as a sourcing channel? I think they're awesome if you know the inventory very, very well. If you're just guessing or you're hoping and you don't know that business that well, it's kind of a crapshoot. Uh, online is great, but the thing is, I I'll give you my experience with pallets and liquidation sales. Some of the stuff was online, some of it was just a phone call. Sometimes you got a fact sheet, and you would just buy the stuff sight unseen, and it would come to you. There's something called compression damage, there's something called shipping damage. It may be fine when you see it, but if they ship it to you, a lot of things can happen. I, this is my preference, and people can disagree with me. I believe in sourcing as much of your inventory locally as possible, or if you're going to source online, it has to be a trusted source. I would have no problem buying furniture from Paoli because I know they're going to ship it right. They're going to ship it on their own truck. 
They're going to make it's not going to be jacked up. And the guys in their warehouse are going to know how to move it. But if someone had some paley desk and they were in just a really poop warehouse, I wouldn't buy it because the chances of it leaving that warehouse and getting to me intact. are kind of slim, kind of slim. So do your due diligence on those things. Get as much information as you can, because everyone's like, hey, you know, I'm buying this liquidation stuff. I got six pallets in. Look at the margins. Look at the rewards. Look at the effort, because Someone gets a pallet and they say they made 10000 How much did they spend for the pallet? How much did they throw away? There's, there's a lot of stuff that goes with that. But once again, I'm a little different. I think, you know, creating your own products, sourcing your own products is just a better way. Oh, I, I get that. It's not pallets, but it's businesses going online. The thing is, how are you going to get the merchandise back to you? Is it a local online auction? Where, you know, you just bid online and you go with your trucks and pick it up. Okay. So do they offer you a preview where you can look at it before the bidding begins? Because if it's local, they should. So, all right. Yeah, that, now that's a little different. Okay. When you asked that question, I thought you were talking about, here's an auction in California and you're in New York. Essentially, that's just an offshoot of a local auction leveraging the internet to get more bidders. That's totally different. If you can put your eyes on it, go by, touch it, see it, take notes, and then go home and bid later. Yeah, that's cool. Sure thing. Uh, any more questions? Because like I said, there's this going to be a lot more information coming, so I'm not trying to make these too long. I'll stay here as long as people are asking questions. And this will be in Hustler U tomorrow. So I will hold on a second and there will be more sourcing stuff because when I get my inventory, I will just show you because just to give you a plan while I'm waiting on questions, uh, I got a daughter. She's 22 years old and I always said I was going to do this with my kids when they got a certain age was create a corporation for them. And I'm going to give you just a little theory on this. I go ahead and create a corporation for them at this age. Go ahead and create them a Roth IRA or a SEP, or even both. 20 years from now, when they're 42, and the corporation's still around, that's an incredibly powerful thing to have in your life. And it's, you know, there's so many things you can do. You can put money in it. You can set money in it. You can, there's so many things that you can do with a corporation when you have a plan. And this is part of my retirement plan, because initially I was just going to set it up in her name. But knowing how young people can be, I'm going to set it up where I'm 51% owner and she's 49. And at some point it'll be all hers, but that's just to keep her from doing anything crazy. Like marrying some dude and he's like, your dad's name ain't on the corporation. That's ours, baby. Ain't happening. Ain't happening. So we're going to talk about that. Like I said, 2014, there's a lot of stuff that's going to drop. A lot of stuff. Okay. Looks like that is all the questions. So with, oh, <laughs> okay, so with that, let's see. Oh, here's another one. Uh, I asked this question before, but you make a webinar about creating an ink or an LLC. That's coming up. I didn't want to just put it out before I did the other ones because I've kind of held back for a few reasons. Like, a, there's probably going to be two LLCs, one just for my stuff, and then that's going to be one with me and her, or we may do an ink. But I will uh, actually, well, there's more questions. I will actually um, talk about that. <laughs> you have a mess. Uh, what kind of stuff would you invest for yourself? Are you talking about inventory or for uh, retirement? Okay, for retirement. Um, I am not a stocks or silver or gold guy because this is this is my thing. I looked at it. Now, I have gold from the safe and stuff. I, I've got some things. I'm not buying anymore because I look at, all right, say you, you amass a bunch of gold, right? Bunch of silver, and then things get really bad. You got to protect your silver. You're going to need guns. You're gonna. There's so many things that go into that. So my plan for the future, going back to with my daughter, 
is creating these co this company and just getting it to the point where it's always going and doing stuff. Uh, my retirement, I think, you know, like I said, I I'm never going to retire, is to have five, six, seven sources of income. And out of those five or six or seven sources of income, I want three or four to be active companies churning out cash versus stocks and all this other stuff. Because if I set them up and I don't have to run them, it's like being retired. And that's the thing. In the future, you're going to be able to do this stuff and not have to be sitting there to make it happen. So I'm not into the stocks and the goals because that's kind of trendy. And if gold gets up to like, you know, 30,000 bucks an ounce, we've got a lot of problems. We're going to have a lot of problems. So I really don't hope gold goes that high. So that's it. But uh, there will definitely be some more information. OK, I want to just say thanks for everybody that came out. There will be more webinars in the middle of the day because I've noticed that the uh, number of participants seems to be higher in the day than at night. And I'm going to roll with that. And there'll still be a few, maybe one a week at night, but most will be in the day. All right. With that, I'd just like to say thanks for everybody coming out, sharing your time, and uh, I'll see you on the good side. Hey, this is Glendon Cameron with Pimping Craigslist for Fun and Profit 2014. This is going to be a different kind of Craigslist instructional tutorial hustle methodology. Craigslist has made a lot of changes, a ton of changes in the last 18 months. Now, I have been using Craigslist for well over a decade, maybe like 15 years, about, four, about 12, about 12, 12, 13. And I don't give up on things that are good because, number one, there's a ton of people using Craigslist. It's an awesome resource. It's Craigslist platform to do what they want to do with it. So when you're going to someone else's house, you must abide by their rules. So with that, there's uh, some other stuff. Uh, there will be another part of this webinar because I'm breaking it up in two parts because it was like the three hours, which is insane. And people were like, you got to be kidding me because I was like, no, 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 no. So this is probably just going to be an hour, hour and a half. And then there will be another part tomorrow. And all of this will be recorded. So if you sign up for it, you get it. You're good to go. So with, let, with that, let's just jump into it. This is what most people are interested in. How to sell on Craigslist. And it used to be very, very easy. I will give you some background. I first discovered Craigslist because I'm like, I'm, I'm going to say 2001. A lot of stuff was going on back then. That's kind of when I was going from my ashy to, yeah, I'm going to say 2001, 2001. And it wasn't a lot of, you know, stuff moved really quick. If you posted something on Craigslist, it went. Like if you saw something you wanted and you didn't call it, it was gone because it was mostly techies. It was technical people, uh, knowledge worker people, and just really, really different vibe. But I was one of the first people to use Craigslist for the storage service business. I have literally had, and this is back in the day before the shows and before the exposure to the business, that I would take a picture of a leather living room suit, pull it out of the unit, put it in the parking lot, take pictures front and back, use my air card, because this was, you know, back when you had to slide your air card in. There was before Wi Fi was as ubiquitous as it is now. I load that sucker up and the air car was like hundred bucks a month, 130, but it was worth it because I remember I was in that for rather leather sofa, chocolatey brown, still smelt new. Pull that sucker out, put um 1500 bucks on it. The unit cost me 250. That sucker was sold before I got home. It was still in the truck. I was like, well, I can bring it to you now, but you know, you're going to have to put it in your house. And it was like, Hey, that saves us truck the trouble of finding the sofa. I mean, find the truck. So it was two guys. They came and got it. I mean, I went to their house, came out, they looked at it, they pulled it out, looked at it. Fifteen hundred bucks cash right there. So I tell you that not to tease you, but to let you know the ease of selling on Craigslist has changed tremendously. Back then, Craigslist was thin. 
It wasn't a lot of people. It was a different demographic. Now, everybody and their mother's on Craigslist. And that's the way it is. So it's still a great place to sell, but your methodology must be different. Just slapping something up there and hoping it will sell is not going to work. I will tell you certain things that you don't need to do anymore. I used to use uh, HTML, make color, coded fonts, and made stuff bigger. You can still do it, but it really doesn't help you like it used to. It really doesn't. Because people have looked, you know, Craigslist now has it where you can put up 24 pictures. You know, the Craigslist photo film that's in my, uh, you know, Craigslist book. You don't really need that anymore. I mean, it's just it's just not there. And also, Craigslist does not let you host anything. You can't host images on the site. It will block your ad. So that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. Now, the deal is, to be successful on Craigslist, you really need volume or specific things. Volume is going to be easier to do if you're new. You can get to specific things later, but... My thing is to get started, to get just to get your feet wet, to start making money. Now, I have done this same formula, and actually this came from a combination of 15 consults. So that was roughly $4,000 that people paid me for this information that I'm giving to you. So it works. It works. Now, before we get really too deep in this, you have to do all of these steps. I'm going to repeat that for the people in the back. You have to do all of the steps. You cannot come here and like, okay, well, I'm going to find 20. I'm just going to try. No, no, no. You need to find 100 things. Now, there are some of you who have 100 things in your home. There's others. You will not have 100 things in your home and you'll need the help of friends and strangers. Do it. You have to get the 100 things to sell. Doesn't matter what it is. It can be clothing. And don't go like, you know, clothing can be notoriously hard, but you need 100 things. And I'm going to suggest a mix, a mix, 20% large, 30% medium, and then the other 50% smalls. You're going to have to do some research. But, and also I will say, go ahead and get the 100 things and start listing because you will start to find stuff out. Now, this is going to piss you off. The first hundred, one, first 100 things you might find, they might be booty. They might be garbage. But you'll know. But the thing is, you're going to learn some stuff from doing this. You're going to definitely learn some stuff. So you have to find 100 things to sell. If you don't know what to sell, go to Craigslist, check out some of the categories, and go from there. This is what's going to happen if you do what I say, you get 100 things to sell. Some stuff's going to sell like that. Some stuff you'll never sell. Some stuff will take weeks to sell. What you're going to do with this 100 things is you're going to get information to build your Craigslist business upon. You cannot come up with numbers before you sell something. Until you sell something, you don't know what cash flow is. You, you, ha you have to do this to build up some information so you would know what you can sell, what you can't sell, what works in your. You're going to get this critical information because you have gotten started. That's the thing. So many people get stuck. They want to start. They want to do the thing. And it's just like they'll start. They just can't keep it going. So another thing to do is create a two month. I'm going to say 90 day commitment or a better 60, a six month commitment of what you're going to do with this business. Because this is what happens. People are like, mm, I'm going to try this for a minute. And I'm going to kind of see if, you know, how it go. That is the recipe for disaster. Don't say I'm going to see how it goes. Don't say I'm going to try it. Say for 90 days, 
I'm going to get these 100 things. I'm going to list them. I'm going to sell. And the next thing is, once you get that first 100 things, you're going to need to get another and another and another. So when you do this, you're going to start making money. You're going to start learning shortcuts. You're going to start learning. when, Because also something that's going to happen when you do this, you're going to get a better sense of what people in your area behave like in terms of buying and selling. This is just going to give you experience. It's like that guy, I'll give you a perfect analogy, and I, I know this to be true. If you are a writer and you write every day, you're going to get better. You can have a person who has innate talent at writing, very good with words, and they write however, whenever. Because th I'm talking about myself in terms of writing every day. I have a friend, great writer, beautiful prose. When, we, when I started, she kicked my ass. Her stuff was just way better than mine. It was. Here it is five years later. She's reading my stuff and her mouth is open and she can't come close. And it isn't because she doesn't have the talent. It's because she hasn't groomed her talent. When you list these 100 things, when you do this stuff, you're going to groom your business acumen. The more that you do, the more that you're going to gain, the faster that you're going to learn. You'll learn. Uh, I mean, some of you may have never listed 100 things, period, on Craigslist at all. You know, you've sold some stuff here and there. I mean, when you go through your mind, think about it. Have you actually listed 100 things the whole time you've been selling on Craigslist? I mean, think about it. Have you? Because if you go in your mind, it's like you listed 10 things a month for a year. Oh, you didn't do anything for Christmas? You, it might be 90. When you do this, you will get results. You will get results. And notice I said 100 things. I didn't say this thing, that thing. You have to kind of figure out what's going to work for you based on where you are. All Craigslist uh, cities are not the same. The bigger the city, the bigger your customer base. So there's a difference there. If you're in Timbuktu, this may not work for you. You know, here in the G-verse, we don't go ahead and go, well, everything works for No. If you're living out in Yippee Kai, Wyoming, no, it's not going to work for you. But there's other stuff that can work for you. That's the reason for the digital businesses. But when you do this, you're going to also find something else. <laughs> there's a barrier to listing. Craigslist is going to stop you, depending on what category you're in, if you're going heavy, 5, 20, 30 or 40 items and you're going to be you no moss you can't list no more you can't list no more paco no you're done which brings us up to the system if you want to list a lot on craigslist you're going to need to have five gmail accounts five craigslist accounts hook each craigslist account to those five gmail accounts now with your google voice you're only going to use one google voice for calls but if you need to, you can switch your phone between Google Voices with the Google Voice app on your phone in roughly 30 seconds. What's going to happen? Actually, no, you can't do that. You'll need to do that with your computer or maybe your iPad. I'm going to say your computer. But I used my computer to do it. And no, if the account's established, yeah, you can switch. But to start a new one, you can't use the app. So if you need to switch between Gmail accounts, and Google Voice accounts, no problem. Now with this, now why five? Why five? Part of the reason is when you're a heavy poster, you're gonna get flagged. You're gonna get flagged. And this is how the Craigslist accounts work. The newer your account, the easier it is to flag. I have put up the most innocent ads and they were flagged. Why? I don't know. I remember one time I was trying to hire someone for 10 bucks an hour. Guy said, I'm going to flag your ad because 10 bucks is not enough. And sure enough, I went back to look for it. It was gone. So you're going to get flagged. Don't get mad. Don't go on Facebook. Don't say, oh, these people are... don't. It's going to happen because you're going to. There are people what I call Craigslist kind of sewers. They're, they have categories that they troll and they, they know everything so when something's been put up over and over again they know it and they're just going to flag it because they're tired of seeing it but they are these people that just perpetually watch and they just watch forever so they're going to flag you don't this is why you need the five gmail accounts this is why you need the five craigslist accounts because 
one of your accounts is going to get compromised. Now, this is the deal. And you can still list with it. And with the Craig's relist feature, even if it's compromised and like, say, you list 30 ads this day, 30, you got like five, 600 ads up, right? Similar stuff. Relist, relist. And you got your other stuff that you put another stuff on. You always want to have more than you need. Always, 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 always. So why Google Voice? Because some people are like, I hate Google Voice. Other people are like, I love Google Voice. Google Voice keeps a record. It keeps a record. Every phone number, every text. For an internet marketer, information is gold. Say, and you can search through the text. Say you have this gold sofa that's shaped like uh, a sheep, a gold sheep, sheep, gold sheep, say, <laughs> a gold sheep shaped sofa, right? And you sell it to someone far away and they just found it because they were looking for the gold sheep shaped sofa and they found you through Google and here it is eight months later, you find another one and this person was just like, oh my God, oh my God. Oh, God, I got to have a, you know, if you get another one, let me know. And, you know, since it's such a unique item, you don't really keep up with the information. But you go ahead and go gold sheep shape sofa into Google Voice. And look at them, bam, bring up their number. So it gives you a database that you don't really have to keep up with. You don't have to pay. The other day, I used that to do some, the similar thing. Someone got something from me about a year ago. And I was like, God, I can't remember the name. Went to Google Voice, put in what I remember. I found it in five seconds. So you you really have to look deeper than just the calling aspect. This is why I push Gmail accounts. This is why I put Google Voice, because you can search your text. That is some awesome stuff. So you can also harvest phone numbers. You can create a phone number marketing plan. Now, it can be spam. What you have to do is ask these people. But what you can do is create a list and just like, bam, I got this and do a mass text. There's technology for that. Mobile marketing is growing. So you want to be in that position. Now, let's talk about build a list with all the responses. This is where I got in trouble. But some people are going to say yes. Some people are going to say no. But you have to ask everyone. As you have people coming to you, you have to develop a pitch. Hey, this is Glendon. I sell furniture. Do you mind if I put you on this list? And I have two lists. I have a list where I can just shoot you a text and I have an email list. I already have your phone number or, you know, just depending on how they come into your your business. I either have your email. Well, no, because with Craigslist, they hide the emails. So this is another re another way to get around certain things. Now that they have the emails, you have a frequent communication with someone. The email will eventually pop up and you'll see their real email. But initially, they it's ghosted. So if you can get people to text you or call you, you've got their number. And that's a very hard thing to get from people. And they're, they're just going to give it to you. And you just like, hey, I want to put you on this mobile. That, uh, and then be honest. It's like if you if it's just like I'm just gonna send you stuff like uh, if you send a lot of stuff and say it'll be once a week or once every two weeks and stick to that. Don't send stuff every day. And the reason you want to send stuff every day with your hundred things, you can kind of build what I call money days. So days Monday and it's like okay Thursday I'm gonna stack all this stuff up. I've got another hundred things coming in. So you just do like this broadcast like hey I'm having a sale on Thursday and concentrate your resources and have a bunch of people coming to pick up stuff on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So you don't have to email blast everyone every day on the sales side. Actually, when I was in inside sales and one of my mentors and actually it was in books that I read said, call no one more once a week, max. That was it once a week, unless you had something really good for them. Say you're on a sales call and we'll use Craigslist and someone buys tables from you and they reference hey uh, if you have any more call me you can call them back no problem but in the other time kind of leave people alone so once a week or once every two weeks and if you do it right and you build up enough stuff you know those two times that you send out that mass communication you're gonna make money you're gonna make money this is how you build a business 
there's as you know with the hustler mindset project there's the opportunistic hustler and there's the strategic hustler this is strategic hustling you got your gmail accounts you got your google voice you're building a list and you're building a business if you get a list of 1,000 people in your city that bought from you, that list can make you six figures. I'm pausing for you to really let that sink in. You get a list of 1,000 people that bought from you, that could be six figures. Yes, six figures. This is one of the things that a lot of people miss when they look at at the disruptive economy they look at uh internet businesses the internet helps some businesses the internet is the sole platform for some businesses so understand the internet does not level the playing field the internet is a whole new playing field and there's still a lot of older businesses that are offline that can benefit from certain features of the internet but going back, you're building the business. This is strategic hustling. This is what I did to build my Craigslist business. This is the same thing I did years and years ago to build my Craigslist business because in the beginning, it will be tough sledding. People will hang up on you. People are going to flag your ads. For, you know, it's going to be difficult in the beginning. But you have that's the reason I say you have to have the 90-day commitment. Or you have to have the six-month commitment. So... You really have to do this. Now, what you want to do, even though you're collecting those phone numbers, you also want to get their email address. You got to have a reason to get their email address. And what you can say is, I have a coupon. If you give me your email address, I'm going to give you a $5 off coupon or a $10 off coupon. And you can literally go out and buy a bunch of shit or get some shit for free and say, oh, I got this. And if you want to use your coupon, fine. So you're honest. <laughs> And you've got that email address and you got their phone number. This is very important stuff. I'm going to recommend AWeber or Get Response. I used AWeber, and I'll tell you I don't use them anymore. And I currently use Get Response, which I love. AWeber is great. Um, it's not that expensive, it's very cheap. But they didn't have the functionality of Get Response. And they were a little harder to use. Get response is very intuitive. And this is another thing. Whenever you pick a email, uh, you know, a company to host your list, stick with it. When you try to switch list, you lose people. You'll see people with lists and they're like Aweber and they've had that list eight, nine years. They know if they try to move that list over to somewhere else, they're going to lose a lot of people. It just happens. People love them. They may have bought some from another day and they will lose those people because the act of reopting in is so onerous for some people that you will lose a lot of them. You will lose a lot of them. So pick one. Do your exploration. I'm saying that Weber or get response because I know these two companies use constant contact a long time ago. I don't know anything about them right now. And I'm going to send you a link for get response because i get some money and of course, this is me strategically hustling if you follow my referral i get some loot yes i do i'm being honest with you and i want you to because i'm asking because what in the g-verse in the hustler mindset project we ask for what we want with no shame we ask for what we want with no shame so if you go with get response and you follow the link that i sent to you I get something out of it. And I'm saying that because I want to you, when you talk to your people, to be that honest and to don't feel weird about it. Don't feel, it's not it's nothing to feel weird about. If that's one of the 50 laws of hustling. You know, you have to ask for what you want with expectancy. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's what I'm telling you to do. I'm gonna send you the link. So now this is the thing that you're gonna run into when you start listing a lot. You're going to run into limits. And this is uh, this is company I used. They're going to charge you four bucks. I, I just say, go ahead and get five or six numbers. Go ahead and create the Craigslist accounts with, the G, with your Gmail account. Just go ahead and create them and start listing on them. Because when you have this many accounts, you, you can't help but make money. You can't help but make money. You list as frequently as you want to. If you really want to go ape, 
If you really want to make your game crisp, shiny, get 10 numbers and open up 10 Craigslist accounts. Because I use my Craigslist stuff for something totally different now than just reselling. I only have really like one account I resell because I don't sell that much anymore. You can use Craigslist and this is going to be another webinar all together. <laughs> just another webinar because it's too much to go into in this one. But this is the company I use. They're great. Uh, you don't get your number immediately. It's like two or three days. Uh, then you've got 30 days to go ahead and go ahead and verify your account. Now, what you will do with one of your Craigslist accounts is you will create a master account. Matter of fact, do this. Take one Craigslist account, not a Craigslist account, but the Gmail account. Make it Gmail account number six, and that is what's your uh, informational account. You'll have all your phone numbers. You'll have all your Craigslist account, passwords, and email addresses, and these. You'll have all that stuff in one place because when you need it and it's like dispersed or on a sheet of paper, because that's what I do. I have one Craigslist account that is the hosting account. It holds all my information. I don't use it for listing anything. I don't send emails out of it. So I can. I never have to worry about anybody hacking it because I've never sent an email out from it. If you never send an email out from it, it's pretty freaking hard to hack when nobody knows where it is. So, and you can hide stuff there. Now, another reason I use Craigslist is to G Drive. Um, there's so many functionalities that can help you with your business with the Craigslist account. Now, don't be boo-boo the fool and just have everything on Craigslist account. Also, get yourself like uh, a Dropbox or something else to also have your information somewhere else. You get up to, what, two gigabytes for free, which will be plenty for hosting this stuff. And it'll always be with you because it'll be on your phone. It'll be on your iMac. It'll be, you know, whatever you need your information, as long as you have internet access or that the folders have downloaded, you still have your stuff wherever you go. But you're going to need the numbers because you you will run into problems with your phone number. Say you use your home number if you have one. Say you use your, your cell phone number. That's that's it. You're, you're stuck. You can actually uh, go around and ask five friends if they, you know, they allow you to use their numbers for Craigslist. But if you it's weird because sometimes they won't ask you for your numbers. Then other times you will. I haven't been asked for my phone number in a long, long time, so maybe they got in the way from that. But you definitely want to have as many accounts as possible. And the beauty of this is you can have one account for furniture. You can have one account for clothes. You can have one account for other parts. And the beauty is whenever you get an email or a text from that account, you know it's money. And it also makes it easier for you to manage your empire, your reselling empire, because it gets fun when something comes in and it's like, hey, 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 I want that. And with the 100 things, you'll always be selling. See, this is where many people go wrong. They'll have 20 things. And out of the 20, five are good. And the other 15 are booty. Booty is nobody want that shit. That's what booty is. It's like, okay, but. It's just not really worth listing and people relisted and relisted and relisted and get mad. Like, why isn't it selling? What? Because it's, it's booty, man. It's booty. If you list something 18 times and it doesn't sell, you have some issues. One the issue may be pricing. Issue may be description. Issue may be pictures. You kind of have to go back and see what the problem is because it may sell better on eBay. I know. Oh, I know. Right. For me to say that. But definitely. This is how you create the system because you want to create consistent cash flow. And if you're only selling sporadically, you're not going to create consistent cash flow. And once again, going back to what I said earlier, you have to do all of the steps. If you skip a step, you will skip the potential to make as much money as possible from your goals. And with that, you will set monetary goals. Once you get your 100 items out, once you get a loose framework of what the stuff is worth, worth, and I will say do this first. Before you even get your 100 items, write down how much money you want to make. If you want to make 1500 in the first 30 days, write it down. If you want to make 4000 write it down. If you want to make 20000 write it down. Because that's going to say, okay, I'm going to make 20000 so I need 
a certain type of items to make 20,000. Because what that does is predispose your mind to go get the stuff that you need to hit that number. Versus, hey, you know, I've got this stuff and I hope to make 300 bucks. You don't want to be that guy or that girl. You don't. Now, this is another part of, that is the strategic hustler. You have to set a listing schedule and stick to it. It's kind of like dollar cost averaging. There will be days that you'll list and nothing is going to happen. Not shit's going to happen. Then there will be days you're listing and every time you list something like 15 minutes later, ding, someone's calling you or sending you an email. And I will tell you, most of my responses from Craigslist have occurred between two sets of hours. Nine to five, Monday through Friday, and like eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it is. So if you're an opportunistic hustler, this could be interesting for you. If you're a strategic hustler, take this information and like, how can you govern yourself? Because say there's eight sellers, right? They're selling what you're selling on Craigslist, but the person is calling you from work. I sold something that's notoriously hard to sell. I sold some nice oil paintings to a law firm. I put them up and I put measurements and I took front pictures of the front and I took pictures of back and said they're ready for hanging. Understand when someone's looking at your ad, they don't know that it's ready. They're like, well, if I get that, this is how the consumer is thinking, because that's why you have to put your beds together if you're going to sell them. I'm like, hmm, is that I want to go to Home Depot and, you know, and get the stuff and I put ready for hanging. I put the ad up. It was up about four hours because I put it up at like 10 o'clock in the morning and I got a call from this lady and she's like, uh, we just moved here and we need traditional, tastefully framed artwork. And I like what you have and I like your price because she said some of the stuff we've been looking at has been like two and three thousand dollars. I had these oil paintings and they were I'm not going to give you inches. I'm going to give you feet. Some were like three by six. Some were by seven by eight. Uh, one was 12 by 6 oil. Very, very, very nice. And I got the unit for nothing. It was a unit that looked like hell in the front. There was a bunch of boxes. And it was it was some kind of firm. It wasn't a law firm. I think they were actuaries. And there was nothing but files. People walked away. And there was about 48 oil paintings in that unit. Wrapped up in cloth. Cloth and then boxes. So the, the big one, I had 2000 on it, and they wanted that. So I took one of my Latino brothers, put it on the truck, and just, you know, and since I was, you know, I was able to do this during the day, went there, and I took all of the paintings with me. And I'm in midtown Atlanta in front of this swank-ass building in, in my Isuzu truck, and I've got this lady who is, I'm going to say it, she's bad. You know, probably mid 40s, but very tastefully dressed. She is she's cute and sexy because she's put herself together very well. So I've got this woman. I'm holding her hand as we go up the lift gate and everything. And I'm just moving stuff. I got my worker. We're looking at stuff and she gets on her cell phone and she's like, Bill, you got to come down here and look at this. Bill is the guy that owns the law firm. Comes down. We bring him up. He's looking. He said, how much for everything? Now, understand, there were other people that were selling artwork on Craigslist. But because I was able to go in the middle of the day and make a delivery and make a presentation, I made some serious loot. $20,000. Yes, $20,000. They wrote me a check. I had to give them a receipt and all this other stuff. $20,000, and that sucker cashed an hour later. So understand, you have to, and let's talk about that. If you are free of a job and you don't have the money that you want, you need to be hustling seven days a week. And you need to be hustling with a monetary plan. I'm going to put 10% away. I'm going to put 20% away. And then once you get some money in the bank, you're going to start taking a day or two off. It's like, this is uh, Monday. I'm not doing shit on Monday. You're going to build your days off because you're going to be working your ass off. But if you're free all the time, there's no reason for you to be broke. 
not in this economy, not with Craigslist, not with Gumroad. Not, there's no reason for you to be broke. I can understand if you're just getting started. It's going to be rocky. Going back to what I said in the beginning, it's going to be challenging because expect flakes, but expect to make money. The more that you list on Craigslist, the more money that you're going to make. And then what's going to happen once you've done this is you're going to have numbers. You're going to have information that you didn't have before. And you're going to be able to make decisions based on that data that's going to make you more money. Okay. Hmm. I put up a bunch of ads. And for me, because it's going to be different where you are in the country. Everyone's not going to get the same result. For some reason, I get a lot of traffic between two and six. Don't you know you 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 posting you posting you posting you're keeping up with? For some reason, I get a lot of traffic to two and six. What do you do with that information? You put all your listing up between two and six. Then, if you get more traffic and more calls and more sales for you, two and six are your golden hours. Or you know you find out that you get a lot of hits early in the morning. This is the information that's going to come by you investing your time and energy into building the framework of your business. Handling customers. Okay. Craigslist is pretty fast. Typically, when someone wants something, they ask what I call buying questions. When can I come get it? Where is it? Do you still have it? Boom, 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 boom. Well, well, I'm going to look... But if you still have it, like uh, tomorrow, call me. Lose that number. This is what's going to happen. I, I went through that several times before I, w I wised up. They will play you because, number one, you call them, which means you're desperate. They are going to hit you with half off or even more. Or they're going to want some serious concession. They're not tire kickers, but they, are, um, they have to get the best deal possible or they're not happy. So with that, you know, you're handling your customers, you're talking, try to, you can actually make sales through text. You can make sales through eBay, I mean, email and the phone call, but try to secure the appointment first. If they're ready to buy, sell, but, you know, try to get to them, try to set up their arrangement, because if you have to meet with them, setting up the appointment is to do it as quick as possible. Set the appointment, get off the phone. And also, this is do this, do this. Airlines do it all the time. Overbook. Yes, overbook. If you have a hot item, and I've done this, and I've had people pissed off at me, because people will flake. the The flake rate is high. I had this really nice TV set and a stand and everything, and like six people called me. And five people made appointments. Two showed up. One that bought it and the one that came late. Six, six serious, serious calls. Five appointments. Two showed up. Overbook. If you piss someone off, I'm like, oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. I thought just claim, you know, dementia, whatever, because you're in this game to win. They're in their game to win everybody's trying to win so you have to govern yourself accordingly do not worry about it over book because your goal is to sell as much stuff as possible and the thing is you may get a bad reputation you may not i never got a bad reputation but frequently when i overbooked just one person showed up i mean seriously like i don't know if you're like still dating but when I was, you know, out there dating hard, I was set two and three dates for Saturday because so many things can happen. Oh, they got a better offer. I do was better looking. Uh, he was going to spend more money or something could really happen. Like someone could get sick and, you know, it can be interesting trying to reset at the last minute on Saturday. So I overbooked on that and frequently. It, that's how it happened. So don't worry about it. This is your business. This is your universe. And you have to do these things. And this is where it comes about being a leader and making those tough decisions because many people wouldn't do that. That's like, well, that's not fair. That's not ethical. Why isn't it? You're trying to sell this stuff. You're not trying to hold on to it. You're not trying to make friends. You're not trying to play checkers with people. You're trying to move product. 
like uh, coffees for closers. This is what coffees for closers from Glenn, uh, Glenn Gary Ross. This is the this is the reality. You don't sell shit. You don't make shit. You have to do what you have to do. All right, let's talk safety. You always hear the Craigslist molester, the Craigslist creeper. I see more carnage on the on the evening news that has nothing to do with Craigslist. Every day, someone's getting killed, robbed, maimed, and it has nothing to do with Craigslist. This morning, these guys in Noonan backed a car up into a gun shop and made off with $80,000 worth of weapons. Had nothing to do with Craigslist. Let's talk about safety procedures. If you have an electronic item, such as an iPad, an iPhone, or a drawer, or anything that's small and like that, and you're going to meet someone, and this applies for men and women, go to Starbucks. Why do you go to Starbucks? They have Wi-Fi. You can test out the device. Get paid on the table. When I used to sell my gold to my gold guy, we used to meet at uh, Joe's Deli. We sometimes, we've got gold and stuff on the table Anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars cash on the table doing business broad daylight. Broad daylight. If you are doing business and you ain't trying to rob anybody and they're not trying to rob, nobody's going to have a problem with that. I remember one day I was there and then some other people came to meet him. And he had like four people lined up with gold to buy from him. And we're all doing business right there. Now, meet inside, sell the seal the deal, sell item. Get your cash. Let them leave first. Man or woman, let them leave. Actually, if you want to be extra safe, watch them leave. Watch them get in their car. Just watch. Wait. And when you get to Starbucks, get there early so you can park close to the building if possible. So when you have to go out and get in your car just like that and go and circle the block a time or two if you really want to be extra ninja. I've done stuff like this from years. I've never been held up. I've never had a gun pulled on me. None of this stuff has happened. And I have sold more stuff than most the average person ha ever has on Craigslist. There was times I was selling stuff. There was probably a good two years where I was selling stuff on Craigslist every freaking day. Meeting people at 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. Now, I'm going to give you some categories. Electronics, high risk. That's what people will try to steal. Incidentally, novelty, uh, Nike, Air Jordan, the same thing. There are certain things that are more high risk than others. I never had anyone come to my house and try to rob me for a sofa. I never had anyone come to my house and try to rob me for a refrigerator or a washer and dryer or a stove. Never had that happen. Electronic stuff, I always met people. I sold my iMac in Starbucks, took it in the box, put it on the table, set the sucker up, plugged it up. Nobody said boo. Person came in, played around with it, gave me money on spot. Now, this is another thing that's happening. You're being, you're on camera. Anything go down, there's a record of you. There's a record of the person. You are safe. So, for stuff. Uh, incidentally, I've sold some guns on Craigslist. And this is Georgia. Now, what I did, and this is, this is when you can do this. Um, you can still do this. You can still do this. I would put up like some gun grips and put in text on the picture that also had the gun. If anyone was interested, there's other ways you can sell stuff. Like if you got some stuff that's prohibited on Craigslist and you can put it in a close enough category, you may get flagged. You may not. Uh, if you get flagged, if you get it sold before, yeah, that's how I sold guns on Craigslist. I don't do it anymore because I don't really deal with guns, but. That's how you can sell a lot of stuff. You know, that's kind of more like the black hat Craigslist technique right there. You can still put text on pictures. That's how the scammers are trying to do it. And it's going to be at some point they're going to get ocular software that's going to be able to detect that. And you won't be able to do that. But that may be two, three years off. But right now you can get away with it all day long. If you want someone to call you and you don't want to put your number in the Craigslist ad, put your number on the picture and that way the spammers can't get your number because they don't have the Oculus software that will read that either. You can put your email and phone number in the picture. So there, there's ways to do that. Back to safety. Um, small stuff, big stuff, usually less risk. Now let me tell you how to sell a car on Craigslist. 
I actually sold Honda. I've sold a few. Never had issues. I actually sold the Honda out the yard because it wasn't running. And the guy brought it with a wrecker. But if you're selling a decent car, this is your procedure. Worked for me when I sold the BMW on Craigslist. Have the title at your bank. Tell the people in the ad that I'm only going to meet you when the bank's open. Tell them in the ad that this is how we're going to do it. You're going to come and look at the car. You can drive it. Test it out. But we must go to the bank. You can bring your money in the bank at the counter in front of the teller. I will sign the title over to you after you give me the money. Did that. Never had a problem. I don't care if they walk in there with six. And actually, I want you to think about this. If the person is a little leery, the fact that you have a very safe, dedicated procedure makes them feel comfortable. Some people don't care. Uh, like I said, I sold the Honda out the car. I sold. I never had. I sold um, Francine's car out of the driveway. Um, never had a problem. But actually, there was like five people around. So that's another thing. Have a partner with you. Have a Craigslist selling partner. You know, you run your hustle together. There, I mean, if you use common sense and you really think about stuff, you're not going to get robbed. You're not going to get killed. You got an iPad and someone's like, hey, yeah, I'll give you 1200 bucks for the iPad if you meet me in the alley at 1 a.m. If you meet that person in the alley, you deserve to die, you dumbass. Come on. So typically when people are having issues with Craigslist, it's not because the criminals are super slick or super smart. It's because they did something stupid. The reality you're going to go out with a brand new iPad and meet someone in the parking lot away from the cameras. You're going to meet someone at the peripheral edge of Walmart away from the cameras <laughs> and then wonder why you got robbed. If you're going to go to Walmart, go inside, meet them in that broad area because there's usually a salon and some other stuff. There's a McDonald's. Meet them there. If you follow this stuff, you're not going to. I've sold the guns. Melamin. Now the guns. All right. This this was a little slicker. It was almost like a drug deal. Um, Georgia, you can sell guns to other people. That's not a problem. I would just like um, be them in the Starbucks and I would give them a bag. And the gun would be in the bag. No bullets. Do not take any bullets with you. It, they can get their own damn bullets. Do not take no bullets. Slide the bag across. They look in the bag. They see the gun there. Okay. Now, understand what I just told you. In some states, we get you put in jail. <laughs> you can do that in Georgia. Do it in Alabama. You can't do it in New York. So, that, that, I'm telling you, this is not going to be on YouTube. People be like, oh, shit. I didn't think of that. So, there, there's a lot of ways that you can skin the chinchilla if you really think about it and just be safe. Just take a few moments and think. Just think. Someone's trying to give you more money than what it's worth. Alarm. Someone is like wants to meet you like at 12 o'clock at your house. Alarm. Just use common sense. Safety. You'll be OK. Now, this is the other part of this. After you get your hundred things. Bam, go immediately. Not after, not when stuff is selling. As soon as you get it listed, as soon as you got your stuff is going, you immediately begin sourcing another hundred things. Yes, you immediately begin sourcing another. You do not stop. This is what kills resellers. I got the stuff I'm selling, and they sit back and they wait for the money versus making the money. When you're making the money, you're not waiting for the money, and you make the money when you acquire the stuff. So you want to just have stuff listed, and then bam, go out and get some more. And come back and make that money. So, on this, I will now open the floor up to questions.